call this meeting to order. This meeting is now in order. Um, if we could have our students come forward. We have some students here tonight. If you would come forward, please, just right up here. Do we have any? I guess we, I guess we don't. Okay. We don't have any students. Okay. All right, then if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance then. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we are to the recognition portion of the meeting. All right, we're doing this a little different, so it's throwing <laughs> me off a little bit. Um, the vision of Sweetwater School District number one states, as an innovative district united with our community, we empower and inspire all students to academic ex excellence in pursuit of their interests and passions. Providing a quality education for all students is our mission. At each monthly meeting, the Board of Education, <clears throat> the trustees, and superintendent strive to recognize the outstanding work of students, staff, families, and the community. This work is aligned to the district's strategic plan outcomes and goals. The first outcome states that the district will create and foster academic success through partnerships with its schools, community, and families. The second goal indicates that the district will nurture a positive learning climate and culture. Tonight we have two Rock Springs Junior High teachers, Ms. Candy Bedard and Ms. Andrea Carroll, and their students Haley Angelovic, Taryn Coughlin, Wesley Muir, and Kamara Schuler here to share strategies they use to reinforce employability skills in their courses and promote positive relationships among students and staff. So I'd like to welcome up Ms. Bedard and Ms. Carroll and the students, please. Good evening, I'm Candy Bedard and I'd like to thank Mrs. Maloney for inviting me to speak tonight um, at the board meeting. This is my 30th year teaching in the business department in Sweetwater School District number one. I'm very proud to be a part of our district's career and tech ed department and feel very blessed to have the opportunity to teach and impact the lives of the youth in our community. Although I'm showcasing my elective courses this evening, I believe that all the teachers in our CTE department do a phenomenal job of supporting the implementation of our district's strategic plan. Um, we do this by increasing student and family awareness of educational and career opportunities in Sweetwater County and beyond, and instilling and reinforcing employability skills and dri a drive for learning. I'm here tonight to share a little bit more about the business courses I teach at the junior high level. In addition to teaching integrated computer technology, which is a required course of all our seventh graders, I also teach two elective classes, entrepreneurship and personal finance management career exploration. Entrepreneurship is a course designed to offer an overview of the American business enterprise system. Basically, my students learn the nuts and bolts of starting and running a small business. In personal finance, my students gain a better understanding of basic money management concepts so they can make informed consumer decisions and better manage their money. Units of instruction include budgeting, banking, credit, purchasing a car, and car insurance. In career exploration, my students have an opportunity to look at their interest skills, personality, and abilities to help them in making a viable career decision in the future. Students also learn skills that will help them gain employment and be successful in their chosen career path. One of the culminating activities in my elective courses is a community field trip. Over the years, I've developed some great partnerships with community members who are always excited to share their knowledge and expertise with my students. For entrepreneurship, I take my students to four or five local businesses, to the Chamber of Commerce, and to the Small Business Development Center. My personal finance career exploration students visit a bank or credit union, a car dealership, an insurance agency, 
the Wyoming Department of Workforce Services, and Western Wyoming Community College. The students love asking various um, questions of the experts in their field, and it's always great to see my students connect their learning to the real world. I'd like to thank Sweetwater School District Number 1 and our school board for continuing to support our CTE programs. Um, I'm confident our CTE teachers will continue working hard for implementation of our district strategic plan and will continue to help prepare our students for the next level of their educational endeavors um, and world of work. And next I'd like to um, pass the mic over to Taryn, who is one of my former students. Hi, I'm Taryn Coffin and I'm an 8th grader at Roxton Junior High. Last year I took Career and Personal Finance with Ms. Bernard. In this class, we learned how to balance textbooks, write, checks, and more things about how to finance your life. One of my favorite activities we did was when we created a PowerPoint on the difference between cars and their prices. We also had the ability to go on a field trip for a day. We went to the banks and places that helped finance our lives in the future. My favorite spots were the banks, mostly because I got to know different jobs that could be filled there. Some things I took away from that field trip was how important it is to manage money. I loved career and personal finance, and it is still one of my favorite classes I've been taking at Rock Spring Junior High so far. Thank you. Hello, I am Andrea Carroll, and I teach 7th and 8th grade language arts at the junior high school. And this year, we decided to do something a little different at the beginning of our day when we have about 15 minutes of downtime from when the bus is come to when the class actually begins. And we decided to start an advocacy group. The students go to an assigned teacher, not, we try to make it not a teacher that they have during the day. So this gives them another adult contact that doesn't have a grade associated with it. It's just a place to kind of chill out for 15 minutes. During this time, we have students check grades. We help them with their grades. Um, the last few weeks, we've been doing a lot of computer technology. We all became Candy's experts. As the year goes on, we are going to introduce a lot of our social emotional learning or a kindness committee. And that's nice kids who have lives, I guess. <laughs> we are going to address some of the activities we're going to do during that social emotional time frame. We have started to create some posters dealing with kindness. So what does kindness look like to each of the students? What does it mean to them? We had this amazing wall of wings that they create the wings, every student, and make a wing of what word or what action shows kindness or shows how we can support each other. And then they can take their pictures under, under the wings. Um, Wesley Muir and his mother helped create a poster that says I and there's a space kindness you may have saw that on a Facebook page so the students can go up before school or after school and take a selfie during school so that would be wrong um, other things that they the students have decided to do are weekly announcements and doing some shout outs things that they have seen that are kind so just calling out different students they are going to give random acts of kindness. So maybe as you're walking down the hall today, give a high five to three different people. And see who you know, challenge that. We hopefully are going to challenge the junior high in Green River in January, I think is when we're looking at it, for different kindness activities and see which school is the kindness throughout the rest of the semester. So there's just a few things that we're doing in advocacy. Again, it's just kind of a place for them to contact another teacher, just have that place of stopping. It's like, oh, friendly face, doesn't give me a grade. Hopefully it's a nice place to do. Thank you. Chair Jellico, trustees and superintendent. Superintendent McGovern, if you'd like to join me down here for recognition.
we would like to present certificates for those that just presented on their strategies they use to reinforce employability skills in their courses and promote positive relationships among students and staff. So I'd like to call Haley Angelovic up, Candace Bedard, and, and Andrea Carroll. Ms. Tina Searle, the principal at Eastside Elementary, is going to join me up here to help hand out this next set of certificates. The district would like to recognize the Eastside Elementary School custodial staff, Claire Shipley, Jay March, and Virginia Sanchez. All three custodians have been instrumental in preparing our school for the year. They offered support with ensuring the hallways had PBIS, academic, social, emotional support posters, and posters that promote school spirit. They painted the chalk wall for students and staff use. All three of these valuable members go above and beyond daily to support staff and students. We would like to recognize Claire Shipley. Oh, she is. I love her smile. Jay March and Virginia Sanchez. Next, we would like to recognize David Galindo. David Galindo has been teaching in the district for six years and ha <clears throat> as he began his teaching career in 2012. This year marks the seventh year of his career. Mr. Galindo, student taught in fifth grade, yet his entire career as a teacher in the district has been in sixth grade at Eastside Elementary. Supervisors of Mr. Galindo describe him as an educator with true integrity, grit, and dedication. His genuine and sincere nature for students is admirable. Mr. Galindo is truly passionate about his students' success, not only academically, but also their social, emotional, and physical health. He teaches from the heart that is matched with highly effective strategies, high energy, and feedback. His students describe him as fair, fun, smart, and creative. Mr. Galindo is currently the head coach for the Rock Springs High School Boys Tiger Swim Team and the assistant coach for the Lady Tiger Swim Team. Mr. Galindo is also musically inclined as he is a songwriter, singer, and plays guitar. He performs with the Eastside Choir each year. His talent and drive to continue to shine and empower his students. Congratulations to Mr. Galindo as Sweetwater County School District Number 1 2020 Teacher of the Year.
Next, we would like to present John Batolo. He's being presented with this certificate of official recognition from the Wyoming School Boards Association for completing the requirements to become a WSBA certified school board member. We'd like to recognize John Batolo. The Transportation Department embarked upon a goal to hire employees who had the desire to become part of the district and transportation team. Several ideas formed to include conducting a family job fair this past summer. The original idea for the job fair was to allow prospective employees to attend, have a fun family day, allow them to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with current employees, and then apply for various positions without worrying about childcare. This idea was presented by Maxine Yeager, who came up with some very amazing ideas. Maxine rounded up several sponsors who provided food and beverages at no charge to transportation. She had several people come in to provide entertainment for the children in the community. This included an amazing educational magic show, dunk booth, face painting, and several games. Maxine had a banner constructed to thank all of our sponsors who were instrumental in making the job fair a possibility. She also organized several radio spots, again, at no cost to the district to help advertise what became the first annual classified um, staff family job fair. Maxine did an amazing job at organizing this job fair to make it a success. She, sh she showed outstanding leadership skills by getting other employees excited and involved to take an idea and make it a reality. Since the successful job fair, the transportation department has been hiring a steady stream of applicants and is nearly at full staff. The entire staff has been instrumental in this effort. However, Maxine's ingenuity and hard work this past summer really got the ball rolling. I witnessed this and it was amazing. We'd like to recognize Maxine Yeager. Next, we would like to recognize Mr. Ted Schroeder. He's being recognized this evening as the president of the National High School Athletic Coaches Association. Mr. Schroeder has served in this capacity for the last two years. The association consists of six committees which are overseen by Mr. Schroeder. In addition, it is Mr. Schroeder's responsibility to ensure that the bylaws of the organization are being followed. It is the duty of Mr. Schroeder and the National High School Athletic Coaches Association to make sure every state is providing education-based coaching services to all students in the country and our coaching with an educational goal in mind. We would like to recognize Mr. Ted Schroeder. Every year, the National High School Athletic Coaches Association has every state give nominations for 19 different sports. 
This year, the Wyoming Coaches Association nominated Brad DeCray for the National Cross Country Coach of the Year. The awards committee for the National High School Athletic Coaches Association is made up of seven individuals who evaluate all applications and come up with the top eight people. The categories that they evaluate are on longevity, local, state, and national involvement, honors, winning percentage, and championship years. Brad has 31 years of coaching experience. He has spoken at four national conventions, has been the Wyoming Coaches Association cross-country representative for six years, has been on the Hall of Fame committee, and the executive secretary for the Wyoming Coaches Association for five years has been selected as Boys Cross Country Wyoming Coach of the Year seven times by the Wyoming Coaches Association and the Conference Coach of the Year 18 times. Brad had 2,545 wins and 895 losses, six state championships, 12 runner-ups, and 18 regional championships. For these reasons, Brad was selected as the National Cross Country Coach of the Year. For the last 32 years, there has been one constant for the Rock Springs High School girls and boys cross country training. One steady rock that has pushed the program to be a state contender almost every single season. That constant is Mr. Brad DeCray. And on June 26, 2019, Mr. DeCray attended the National Coach of the Year Awards Banquet to hear his name announced for this prestigious award. Such success is evident through his tenure as when the girls earned their first ever state title in 1990 and the boys earning a state title in 1995. With this start, the program has never looked back and has stayed at the top ever since. From 1995 to 1998, the girls earned four straight runner-up finishes with sustained success from the boys team resulting in 11 straight years of top two finishes, including five state titles. Continually, the championships came in bunches as the Tigers won three in a row from 1995 to 1997, and they went back to back in 2004 and 2005. This passion and success not only has not only resulted in National Coach of the Year honors, but Mr. DeCray will also be inducted into the Wyoming Coaches Association Hall of Fame next year. Mr. DeCray's resume will boost sending close to 50 athletes onto Division I programs. Wow. That's amazing. Um, Rock Springs High School and Sweetwater County School District Number 1 would like to honor and recognize Mr. Brad DeCray for his time, commitment, and passion in helping students succeed both on and off the track. Congratulations. Last but not least, we would like to recognize um, some of our 2019 retirees. First, we'd like to recognize George Chopsky. He's worked in the district 42 years beginning 1977 in the industrial arts auto mechanics at Rock Springs High School. His education consists of a BS in education industrial arts from Shadron State College and an MS in, in industrial education from the University of Missouri. We would like to recognize George Chopsky. Next, we would like to recognize Henrietta Flores. She's been in a district employee for 18 and a half years, beginning August 1995 in nutrition services and custodial services. We would like to recognize Henrietta. Next, we would like to recognize Norm Gary. 
He's been a district employee for 37 and a half years, beginning in March 1982. He's been the stage manager at Rock Springs High School. Is Norm Gary here? Last but not least, we would like to recognize Pete Pitch. He's been a district employee for 30 years, beginning June 1989. He's been a district-wide maintenance electrician. Pete Pitch here. Pete Pitch here. Pitch Pete. <laughs> okay. Well, that will conclude recognition. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. West, if we could have the roll call, please. Mr. Reedy. Mr. Hay. Mrs. Johnson. Mr. Jackman. Mr. Nicholson. Mr. DeFolo. Here. Here. Could I have a motion for the approval of the agenda? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. The motion passes. Uh, I'd also like to entertain a motion for the addendum. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of adding the addendum, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. The motion passes. Moving on to the superintendent's reports. Uh, transportation update, Mr. Klingenfield. Madam Chair, member of the board, Superintendent McGovern, I'm Joe Klingenfield, here to give you a transportation update. Um, we've been working pretty hard to, can you guys hear me? I'm sure you can, I think I talk about it. We've been work, working very hard to uh, abide by the strategic plan, the goals and the vision of the district. So the things that we've been doing have been along those lines, and it's been very successful, actually. Oh, I got a quick one. So you already heard about the family job fair. Uh, we did that last summer, and it was very successful. Maxine Yeager did an outstanding job with that. Uh, I came to her and said, this is what we'd like to do, and that was pretty much all I did. She took care of the rest, got everybody involved, and it was, it was a success. I don't think the transportation has been fully staffed for quite some time now, and we're well on the way to being fully staffed. By the time we get everybody trained and hired that's, that are in the pipeline, we should be fully staffed. Um, one of the things we're doing to help with that is we're working in partnership with the State of Wyoming Department of Workforce Services. Uh, we're not going to start that till the winter time. They said during the summer, people are out. They, they are going to do what we're going to do. We're going to do another mini job fair right there uh, in the mall. And that's when people are there when it's a little bit colder. So that will just kind of give us a little bit of a pool of applicants that we can hire as needed. Uh, and then we're also working in partnership with Elwood staff. We really haven't needed to do that, but they are on the back burner. I said if we need anything, to get in contact with them. And we'll be contacting them and But so far, we've been doing pretty well with our, our applicants and with our hirees. So, transportation is rolling the strategic plan. What we want to do, one of the things that we're trying to do is move transportation into the technology age. We have a lot of people that didn't even really know how to do email. So we're moving them that way through another monkey wrench into their thinking. We're actually going to set them up with Google accounts so that we can get on Parent Square and start using that for communication, not only in parents, but with each other. So that's something we're moving forward. Um, we're working on a culture change, okay? To include, include positive work expectations, uh, to include working in conjunction with our district. I want to bring us more in line with what the district is doing. It seemed like transportation is kind of an island on themselves for a while. 
now we're moving in and working with the district, working well with all the principals are doing a wonderful job working with us. Uh, some of the things that we have to do over there, uh, there's a lot of things that we are doing that require a lot of time, a lot of hours, and we're limited on both hours and drivers. But the principals, the district is working really well with us to make things work. If we have a problem, we can go to them. If they have a problem, they come to us and we work as a team. So that's really positive. Um, another thing, we're recognizing employee years of service. So we got years of service training. Another thing I'm thinking about doing, we haven't done yet, but I'd like to get a, I don't know, one of those little decals that you put on the buses, put their names on there, maybe star for their years of service. We haven't started yet, that yet, but that's one of the things that we were thinking about doing also to help recognize their years of service. And then contributions at the board meeting, just like with Maxine again. We're trying to do that as much as we possibly can. Because they do a lot of great things over there. We have a wonderful staff. I'm really proud of them. With all the things that they do, the work that they do. Uh, so we're proud of them. Uh, another role in the strategic plan, uh, safety, okay, our training. Uh, we want safer drivers for our students. So we are always looking for training. My safety and training coordinator, he's uh, Jerry Macy, he's always looking for something. Some of the things that we've done just recently is Montana winter driving. We go up to Montana, teaches them how to drive. They have skid pads up there, teaches them how to get out of the skid. And that's actually come into play last winter with some of our drivers over there. Uh, one that had gone to training, one that hadn't, both going down the same hill. The one was able to recover that went to the training, the one that didn't go to the training uh, wasn't able to recover from that skid. Nobody was hurt, but there was some property damage. Uh, we're doing Casper Mountain training. Um, there are a couple hills in Wyoming, Utah, Denver that we're concerned about. So we do uh, Casper Mountain driving training. Another thing we did was we used to go down to Texas to train the trainers. So they would train our trainers how to train our employees, our new employees. Um, that was kind of costly. So what we did this year is we actually brought them to us. It was a lot less expensive and we were able to train more people. We trained about 13 drivers in that for training the trainers and now our over the road drivers were involved in that. Now they're training our drivers, our new drivers that are our route drivers. Okay. Um, like I said, the training coordinator is always looking for training. Anything that we can do to help make it safer out there for our drivers and our kids. <clears throat> so one of the issues that I have over there that we have with transportation is our facility. We've outgrown our facility. We don't have enough room at our facility. Uh, I understand the issue with that. I mean, it's all about money. But the Wyoming School Facilities Commission, the School Bus Maintenance and Parking Facility Guidelines, developed in 2013, we're considered a large facility. Anything over 95 buses is a large facility. We have over 95 buses. So the guidelines, they require uh, 27,000 square feet. That includes your offices and your shop. We've got about 11,840 square feet. Actually, not that much. <laughs> uh, we're supposed to have nine or more bays. We have four usable bays. Uh, enclosed parking is supposed to be 50 to 75%. We, we have no enclosed parking, which causes problems in the wintertime with gel and stuff like the fuel. Uh, our maintenance supervisor, the the, uh, the head mechanic, fleet supervisor, whatever you want to call him, needs an office. Right now he doesn't have an office. His office is actually a, a chain link fence with the bus about three feet from him when they're using those impact lenses, which they do a lot of design with the top of the phone. So he has to interrupt this conversation, call them back or go elsewhere. Um, we're supposed to have three lifts. We have zero lifts, but the reason we don't really have any lifts in there is because you have to have an obstruction clearing at the ceiling of 18 feet. We have a clearing of about 12 feet, which doesn't even allow us to uh, lift the bus. We can jack it up on one side a little bit, but all our mechanics are under the bus. There's any type of issues in the bus are on three years. They can't even lift them up to get them again. Um, there's supposed to be a secured mechanic tool storage. We don't have that. Some of the other the facilities issues we've run into, we have limited employee parking. Our employees have to be parked and then uh, down by on the other side of Overland and then shuttled back to transportation. And, and I haven't done it yet, but what I want to do is I want to share the cost of fuel, wear and tear on the, or the shuttle buses. We use a vans for that, the small school buses. And then employee showers here, how much that costs us a day to do that and figure out what that costs us a year. It's quite expensive, I'm sure. 
So that's one of the issues we have. Uh, we have water infiltrating our, our fuel vaults. I found out the other day that it is it's from the vault and the tanks inside those vaults aren't being compromised. So there's still there's there's no leak in the fuel vaults or the fuel tanks itself, just from the vault. Um, and then the bus parking issues, our pad was is cracking and sinking. Okay. We did a geo study on that. Um, the good news is there's no hydrocarbons or anything that were located. However, it's on a sandy, silty uh, land, so it is shifting under there. So it's sinking and cracking. And we've got pretty good sized cracks out there in our parking lot. We've had employees, several employees, trip and fall out there. We haven't even hospitalized for a while because of the cracks and stuff out there. Um, way back when, before we were all or the transportation director, uh, they didn't construct that pad mm -hmm. directly. So that needs to be rectified to get sooner rather than later. Our district fleet, uh, our district fleet hasn't been updated in quite some time. You'll see a lot of the ones that are surplusing. And I haven't even replaced those yet, but um, we've got vehicles that range from 2000 to 2003 to 2015. Our six district fleet vehicles that, that the teachers and the uh, administrators drive. Um, of those six, I think three can be retained in service and three are at this point unsafe to drive. And there really isn't anything we can do about it because it's way too expensive to fix those. It, it just wouldn't be worth it if it's the age and the amount of the vehicle. Um, and in fact, on a later board agenda, I'll be requesting um, funding to get to replace our district fleet. Okay, not all of them. Some of them need to be but we need to replace our district fleet. Uh, that includes maintenance vehicles, a food service vehicle, um, and I think that's it in the, in the district fleet. Yeah. So we're in the process now of uh, taking that out and getting kids for the um, Let's see. So we've already talked about that. I will be talking about that at a later time. Chapter 20, the new transportation rules for students, no transportation zone. They changed it this year, eventually, as soon as it comes in service. But what they're going to do is they're going to make it a implementary year. So 2000 this year, 2019-2020, is an implementation period. So it's going to be treated like this year, so 2018-19. So the elementary, and this is a radius. Uh, the no transportation zone for elementary students is 1.5 miles. The new one's going to change it to one. Secondary schools is two miles, and it's going to stay the same. Uh, the radius, uh, the elementary and secondary, that's determined by the by the district. So we, I think we did K six and then seven, twelve or something like that. Um, all routes, added routes when it goes to the new radius for the elementary school. I don't anticipate any routes to be added. Uh, it'll be very few, if any at all. Yes. Uh, if we go back to that one, yep. I think um, the current one is is for elementary is one point miles. I think it's going up to one point five miles. Is it not? I mean, but, we're, it, I mean, we're grandfathered have, this year, right. but the, when they do implement the new rules, I think it will go to 1.5 miles. Is that not true? Well, I don't know. I, I may have switched those around. So, okay. but I. That's my recollection from the meetings I've attended. So. Yeah. So, it's one mile now. It's going to go to 1.5 miles. Which means uh, that students yeah. within 1.5 miles of right. the school will no longer be transported. Transported. That's why it's called the mobile transportation zone. Correct. I'm going to check on that because I'm, I'm not That's exactly sure on that. That's my reflection from the meetings okay. that I have attended. Okay. All right. But the, the, it is kind of a grandfathered year. It is this year, yes. Right. So I haven't really, I mean, I haven't looked into it yet. If that's the case, you know, we won't be any stops at it at all because it's a, it's a, it'd be a bigger radius. Okay. Uh, right. Also, we've had an issue. We had a uh, five-year, well, actually, we did a 10-year replacement plan on all our vehicles throughout the entire district. Um, and then for 2012 to 2017, 
no questions asked a minimum. If you wanted to change the Type A, which is the, the van school bus, you could change that at six years, 110,000 miles. They'd like you to go up to 830,000 miles. The Type C, which is the conventional one with the nose on it, uh, nine years, 150,000 miles. Type D, nine years, 150,000 miles. District vehicles were six years, 125,000 miles. Uh, so over the past few years, the replacement schedule has changed drastically. So for 2018, they went from Type A from six to 110 to 15 years and 200,000 miles, so nearly doubling that. Uh, type C, 15 years, 225,000 miles. D, 16 years, 250,000 miles. Uh, and then for the new Chapter 20, which hasn't been enacted, it's the, it's the proposed one. Went from Type A, uh, 15 years to 215,000 miles, so that went down mileage-wise a little bit. Type C went up to 17 years and 240,000 miles. Type D went to 17 years, 240,000 miles, came down to 110,000 miles. And then the district is state to state 15, 200,000 miles. The concern I have, the vehicles are never going to last that long. Uh, it's going to be hard for us to get the miles on there. The Type D, the transit buses that we use for activities, maybe, because a diesel engine is made for going down the highway, and the miles on that will, they, you could get that 240,000 miles. For years, I don't know if the miles are still. For a Type C, a diesel is not made for stopping and going on a route. I don't really see us ever doing that. They do have a uh, severe service clause where if you're having an issue uh, with a vehicle and it's costing more than 30% of the price of a new vehicle to uh, make, maintain it, you can, you can get a new vehicle. That's probably what we'll have to do with both of them because our type C is going to make it 240,000 miles. So we've kind of done a shift in our maintenance scheduling, our maintenance outlook. We're planning on things that we can do to help these vehicles make that, those number of miles and those number of years. It's going to be tough. Mr. Plankton, <coughs> yes. again, the meetings that I have attended, there has been serious concerns relayed by district officials, transportation directors, business managers, the like, superintendents, the like, about these distances. And for so many, you know, we've had that moratorium, so meet, the bus mileage has gone up. There is an awful lot of concern about the conditions under which these these buses travel. Some of them are traveling on dirt roads uh, and those kinds of things. So obviously they're not going to be able to sustain the number of miles that uh, that they're suggesting. So there's lots of concern about this. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I, we do have a lot of concerns. Rick Bennett and I, our head mechanic, we've talked about it a lot, and there are a lot of concerns to add with that. I mean, we've had Type C buses that are 10 years old and have 130,000 miles where the doors have rusted off the service doors for the students' loading doors and the bottom's rusted and you've had to replace the doors. So the, the bodies really start falling apart, but like you mentioned, on those dirt roads, like up in Parson, it's, it's really, really bad up there. So, but wherever we go, you're absolutely correct. Okay. That's all I have, unless you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. They're making it easy on them. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Jackson? Um, so you mentioned a lot of issues with your facilities. Does that go through the school facility commission or is that a test thing? School facilities. Okay, just making sure. Yeah. So where are excuse me. No, I'm so sorry. where are are we on a list? Are we in a, in a process? <laughs> where are we with the with the lack of facilities that we obviously have? That's a great question because there's a lot of people on the list that are ahead of us, but they look at um, how dire straits are we in, how inexpensive can we do it, and uh, actually Dan uh, helped me out quite a bit with some ideas. Um, we can do it for pretty inexpensive because we can do it on the site that we're at. We just extend to the north and to the south, actually, and then kind of straighten out that uh, west side a little bit. And it would give us plenty of room for a new building. It would give us plenty of room for bus parking and employee parking up there also. And I think we can do it a lot less expensive than any other districts can at this point in time. Uh, it's a political game. I mean, you gotta you got to lobby for it, and that's what we've been doing. So... <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you.
All right, thank you. Rock Springs High School and Nutrition Services update. Mrs. Fletcher and Mrs. Aramosby. Chair Jellico, members of the board, Superintendent McGovern. Uh, Ms. Aramosby and I are here today to give you a little bit of update on Nutrition Food Services, as well as all of the craziness that ensued at the high school um, at the start of this school year. So we don't have a PowerPoint, <laughs> but you do have a couple of handouts coming your way because some of the things were just a little too complicated and seeing an example might be helpful. So for those of you that may not know, the high school started a new bell schedule, a new instructional model, has new staff, a new office, a new lunch plan, and a new breakfast plan, all in the first couple days of school. So we feel a little bit like the boa constrictor in the Little Prince, in that we chose not to eat the elephant one bite at a time, but to take the entire thing in all at once. And on the surface, we may look a little bit like a hat, but in actuality, we really are still the boa constrictor. So what you have is a copy of our bell schedule. That's this first one, so you can kind of look at just the general layout of what our bell schedule looks like. And then, thanks to Mr. Hollingshead on the back, you have every iteration of if we had a day off, then what? Because everybody's always asking, if there's a day off, then what? So that's what's on the back. The thing that's different is we're on a modified block schedule where Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of a full week we only see four classes, and then on Friday we see everything. We have seen our teachers struggle a little, and some of them embrace fully the longer blocks of instructional time. And in those longer blocks of instructional time, we've seen the depth of knowledge and the learning go to all sorts of different levels. And because we have half as many transitions, we've seen the discipline in the hallways go down. We know that we have a few other challenges coming our way, but we have seen some great improvement on um, the implementation of that bell schedule. The reason behind that bell schedule wasn't just for those things we mentioned, but the bell schedule also allows students one more opportunity to take something. So you have two sample student schedules in there for you to look at to give you an idea from a student perspective. Because the schedule has lots of facets. It impacts the teachers, it impacts um, the school staff, it impacts food service, it impacts the students. And all of those pieces together create a different story. So this gives you an idea of some of the creative things we do with schedules. The first row is their odd day, the second row is their even day, and the last row is their all day. So you can kind of see what a student would see. The next page is front and back and shows you what a teacher might see. The front side, um, or one side, the short side, is what you would see if you were to look on PowerSchool, our information system. And it only tells a snapshot of the story. So on the back, you have what weekly that teacher would actually be doing. So what are they teaching? When are they on PLC? Which PLC are they in? Uh, when are they supervising kids? When do they have a break? It kind of lays out a typical teacher. And I just chose one of our math teachers who happens to have three preps, so they have three different PLCs. So you got kind of the, the full deal of what something looks like. And then the one that we splurged on color is what our school looks like when we talk about our teachers having opportunities to collaborate together. There's a PLC going every hour of every day. We have nearly 50 different PLC groups running in a typical week. Third hour is the only hour where we don't have a teacher-driven PLC. That's when our administrative PLC meets and our counselors meet. Um, by staggering them in such a way with the five of us, we can generally hit all of the PLCs at least for a touch base. We don't always stay. When you start to look at all of these things that we have placed on our master schedule, we have asked the structure to carry a very huge weight. Because we chose to believe that the structures are there 
to provide us opportunities for students and teachers. So we were willing to take the risk, and our teachers were so willing to follow along with us. We had the support of the central administration, uh, the support of food services, to try something very different. This type of a PLC model with this many things going on and this level of expectations is not seen in a secondary school system very often at all. We are already seeing our PLCs do amazing things. Most have already made it through their first data review cycle, meaning they have given a common, well, they've written a common assessment, given a common assessment, talked about the data, and adjusted instruction accordingly. We have asked those teachers to also be thinking about how do we reach and touch those at-risk populations. We've had discussions about how do you create opportunities for nonverbal responses for kids who don't yet speak English. How do we ensure that our co-teaching pairs are meeting the needs of our special education students? Those conversations are rich, and our teachers don't give themselves half the credit they deserve for the work that they're doing every day in the PLC group. You'll find later, when Ms. Bolton has to come up and talk to you about our schedule, uh, that putting all of these pressures on a system, increasing the number of classes available for kids, increasing the number of staff, and still keeping a very large population happy means that the schedule bends and breaks in a couple of spots. We're willing to take those bends and breaks for the benefits of the end. Uh, in, in that end, as Mr. Hollingshead and my administration team and I were thinking about and reflecting on the schedule, we did a couple of things differently, and we've actually proposed a policy that's going to policy committee that would change how we look at teachers and how we look at classes a little bit that might provide us a little bit of extra flexibility. Not to put more work on a teacher, but to allow this, this system that we're creating to bend and flex and, and to be more responsive to the needs of kids. It also means there will probably be some changes at semester. So if you hear rumblings in the community about, oh, my kid's second semester schedule isn't done yet, it's not done. Because if we see things in the schedule that we need to adjust to better serve our kids, then we want to be able to make those adjustments and have that ready for them come the 1st of January. One of the biggest changes, as you'll notice, we instated a second breakfast and we decentralized our lunch. And like, what is she talking about? So at the high school level, I don't know about you guys, but my students and my own kids tell me that the cafeteria may not be the coolest place in the building. In fact, hanging out in the front hall or down on what we call Cowboy Corner by the bathrooms is a way cooler place to be. So we took the lunch service with the help of Ms. Aramosby and we decentralized it from the cafeteria. And lunch is now served in the library, it's now served in the front hall, and it's served down in Cowboy Corner. We have seen our number of students on campus increase. Uh, we have seen kids enjoying different lunch options from different places. and. It, it's been a challenge, and it's been change, but I think in the long run it's been some, some really good change. We also have second breakfast, because if any of you have a teenager around, you know that 7 o'clock in the morning is not the time to convince them to get in the car, eat their breakfast, remember their shoelaces, and all of that at once. So at 9 o'clock, we offer them a second opportunity to have breakfast. And that second opportunity uh, has been taken advantage of, and then share that Ms. Aramosby, which we thank you greatly for taking this leap of faith with us as we put some pressure on things. We'll have a little more to say about that. Tell you. All right. <laughs> so along those lines, we have seen a huge increase in lunch compared to last year at this time. Last year we had 3,000, or I'm sorry, breakfast. We had 3,000 breakfast served. And I just went through August. We haven't gone through September yet kind of waiting to get the new software up and rolling. We have to do some manual entries at the high school right now. They're doing job forms, so the kids are kind of entering their names into the computer, and then we have to go in afterwards and put them in through our POS systems that are down in the cafeteria. So um, with that being said, we've noticed that just across the district, um, last August compared to this August, we've had a 1,000 more kids eat breakfast at this time, which is huge. So um, the interesting thing is, though, it's a lot more paid kids been free and reduced is what we're seeing. I am not, which is fantastic. You know, we want the paid kids eating too. I just, I don't really know our free and reduced numbers yet. We're kind of working on that. That kind of, we kind of get that figured out around October. 
But um, at this time, you know, it's just showing that there's, we had a tremendous increase in paid kids eating breakfast across the entire district, which is fantastic. I had the pleasure of working at Pilot Butte, and there was a little guy that came through the line. I was helping out there, and we were making fresh oatmeal, and then they get the options of fresh berries or, like, a small amount of chocolate chips, like a tablespoon. Kids love it. They're going crazy over it. We have gone through so much oatmeal. But this little guy comes through. He's like, oh, my gosh. He's like... I love it here. He goes, I can't believe they have things like this here. <laughs> so he just thought it was the best thing ever. So it's stuff like that, you know, that it's great. So kids are eating oatmeal, they're eating yogurt parfaits. They love those. Those have been a huge hit. So I mean, the kids are really liking, you know, what we have so far. And we're going to keep growing with that as well. Um, lunches, I think, um, with the stations around the school, the high school, I think there was some confusion at the beginning. I think kids thought that there were different things at different stations around the high school. We're serving all the same things out in those stations. In the cafeteria itself is where we're having different things. Um, we're going to be doing a ramen bar pretty soon up at the high school. So we're going to be just kind of changing, just adding new things up there too. So we're gradually growing. It's been an adjustment for sure, but the staff is, is doing really well. I have a great staff up there across the entire district, as a matter of fact. I really do. Um, whiteboards. I need to get whiteboards just in, across the, at the stations. That's one thing I do need to add. But... Um, we're just th so one thing I think is interesting because I worked at the high school pretty much all that first week. So I think one thing to note with all of these lunches, we do have a lot of kids, you know, eating up there, but they're they have plenty of time to eat. They make it through all the lines and they still have 15 to 20 minutes to eat. So they have plenty of time with this one lunch for sure. Um, we will be getting the vending machines. Uh, I got an update last week. I need to call and find out. So they're in transit this way. So we'll be getting the vending machines. Um, Farson, Black Butte High School, the junior high, and of course the high school. We'll be getting those soon. So I'm really excited about that. And then um, the stations will be arriving this week. Probably at the end of the week is what I've been told. So we're gradually getting put into place the new software mosaic. That team is coming in on Monday to train all of my staff. So that should be, they're staying here all next week and Hopefully everything's going to be up and running smoothly. The tech department here has been absolutely fantastic, you know, working with getting us all squared away with that. So we're moving along. Um, another thing that I've received a lot of phone calls on is My Payments Plus. I don't know what's going on with it. I think there's like some glitch with it. We've just asked parents to send payments to the school for the most part. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, parents are worried that they made three payments on My Payments Plus. It doesn't go through, then other people are fine. I don't know if it's a browser issue. I'm not quite sure. But um, if that does happen to anyone, I would recommend calling their tech support, the My Payments Plus, or even just sending a payment to, to school with your kiddos. Um, we will also, the other question I've been getting a lot of is Nutrislice. We no longer have Nutrislice. I think some people that haven't updated their browser, they you know just keep their windows open in their phone. They're like, Nutrislice isn't, you know, I can't see my kids' menus. And it's showing Nutrislice, and they would send me screenshots of Nutrislice. But I think it's because they just haven't closed out that window. Um, so we no longer have Nutrislice. Like I said, we're going to Meal Viewer, which is kind of similar. So we're going to be moving on to that next week, within the next couple weeks as well. So then we'll have online menus again. Right now our menus are, if you go to the district website where it has bus routes, there's the menus that are like the fourth or fifth line drop down. So that's where you can find our menus at this time. Um, there's just, I don't have like teacher, I think we're getting more teachers eating, you know, and adults eating as well. I don't have that information. I think as time goes on, once we get the software system up and rolling, I'll be able to give you guys a much clearer picture as to where we're at. But right now, breakfast is up, which is fantastic. Uh, lunch is down just by like 300 kids compared to last year, so we're kind of about the same. So we're doing pretty good. Do you have any questions? Yeah, Brett. Mr. Mickelson. Madam Chair, thank you. First, I just want to say this is really awesome. And thank you guys and your team and central administration for going forward and trying this and again it, it looks super uh, and I'm really excited but I have a really important favor to ask when you get the ramen bar will you email me okay. so I can come try it of course awesome. thank you of thank course. you very much mm -hmm. any other questions okay uh, Mrs. Aramosky Aramos, excuse me uh, there we have no update on the financial picture for this month. Okay. So we, I, I understand that that's mm -hmm. an issue with the 
software, that kind of thing. So what I would ask is that for next month, you have both months. Okay. If you would do that, please. I'll get that to you as soon. I mean, we can have it at the board meeting next month, but I'll definitely get that to you as soon as we get it. Oh, no, the board meeting will be fine. If we can just is that what you yeah, yeah, Okay, that's yeah. fine, whatever you prefer. Board meeting and okay. we can have both months. Sure. Realizing that Thank you. This yeah. time, so. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Jellico, Superintendent McGovern, and the remaining board members. I am Sarah Blake, the principal at Desert View Elementary School, home of the Desert View Mustang. Oops, sorry, but <laughs> Recently, our PTO so kindly purchased us a mascot for our school. <clears throat> the problem is, the mascot currently has no name. Over the past couple weeks, <laughs> Desert View asked classrooms and families to discuss name options and then nominate a name from each class. The Desert View staff then voted to decide the top three names from the submissions. We are now here presenting to the board as we would like your input as well. Today, I have with me students from the classrooms that had a top three name. They will introduce themselves and tell you what the name their class has decided on then we will give you a ballot to vote on our final name. Please vote for just one, but our Mustang needs a name. So I will ask, my name is Shamley. I'm in second grade and my teacher name is Mrs. Blazovich. Our class name for the horse is called Dusty Roads. <laughs> Good job, pretty fast. Oh, you go stand by the Mustang. Okay. My name is Addison, and my my teacher's name is Miss Leffler, Miss Leon, and our class voted. Marty Mustang. And that's our first grade class. My name is Philip, and my and my teacher's name is Miss Unger Allen, and I'm in second grade, and our class chose Dusty. Rusty. So if you guys could take a minute and circle your choice, please. And Philip will come around and collect them.
Are we going to get an instant answer? We're going to get an instant answer, yeah. <laughs> Yes, the PTO is putting on a root beer float party for the class that wins. <laughs> the mascot just would feel better if she had a name. <laughs> or he. Okay, with a vote of four to three, the name will be Dusty Rhodes. <laughs> Thanks for joining us in our fun. Thank you. Thank you. hard to follow that. That was really fun. We should have ended on that note. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, I am Stephanie Tolman and I'm the Chief Information Officer and I am here to talk a little bit about our content filter. If you get the district emails or emails in the administrator group, and I'm sure some teachers here are probably shooting daggers at me right now, um, the state of Wyoming on July 1st adopted a new content filter. And by content filter, I mean that's the program that we use to regulate what our children access on the internet so that we're SIPA compliant. For many years, we've used Lightspeed. The state provided Lightspeed to us. Um, I vaguely remember the implementation of that, and it was, it was rough, I think, as with any new thing is. Um, starting July 1st, we switched over to IBOSS, the new five-letter, four-letter word in my department especially for Zach, okay, Zach. Um, we've run into some issues. We've worked with the company literally hours. <clears throat> I think we had a few days where our Chrome browser wasn't filtering. We weren't even where there was an issue until some teachers brought it to our attention. So we worked with iBoss. We figured out it was a setting under our Google umbrella within Chrome. The company didn't, they do it for Chromebooks, they didn't realize that that would be a similar impact on our MacBooks, so our, Chrome, our Google umbrella was actually overriding the, the filter. Um, once we got that fixed, yay, we could tell it was working because I think that night Zach and I got 6,000 emails asking that Netflix and Facebook and Cool Math Games be open, so yay, kids are being filtered. We come in the next day and everything is being filtered, <laughs> literally everything, our website, um, we were having slow response times. Our internet speed was incredibly slow. So I just wanted to kind of let you guys know where we're at. We worked with the company today. Today the problem was that if you opened Safari first, then it wasn't filtered. But then if you restart the computer, then Safari would start to be filtered. The company, after having us upgrade everybody to version 5 on Friday, has asked us to downgrade everybody to version 4 today. Zach's been really patient. I can hear him talking to them on the phone in my office, and we actually now have the cell phone of our senior customer service person who's also a tech support person, so we have him on speed dial, and I do think it was probably about six hours today. Right? Yeah, six hours working with iBoss. So as with any new implementation, there's always bugs. We looked at this as an opportunity to kind of do the clean slate. We didn't pull out our block list that we had in Lightspeed because it was... 10 years worth of websites and we wanted to make sure that we had a clean implementation going in. 
there's some growing pains here. I think other, I know other districts around the state are having similar issues, but we're working through it and I just really appreciate everybody's patience as we get through it. So, sorry, just wanted to let you know if you hear kids can't get on anything or for a minute got on everything, that's, that's where all of this is coming from, through our eyeballs implementation. You guys have any questions? Thank you guys. Further public comment. Mark Cholock, SCA president. Um, <clears throat> there's one issue um, this uh, this fall so far that um, it, it is really, I think, large enough to be considered a district-wide issue, and that has to do with uh, the physical environment in a lot of our buildings. Um, the high school where I work has uh, been virtually intolerable uh, because of the heat. Um, I come in early in the morning, I open the windows to try to get some cool air in. Um, by nine o'clock, it's pretty much gone. Um, it, uh, uh, it impacts learning, it impacts uh, classroom management, um, it impacts, uh, by, by the last class of the day, um, I can barely keep kids awake anymore. Um, it's, uh, um, I, I, I know that uh, people at the junior high have mentioned, uh, have experienced similar uh, issues with, with the heat. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you had been uh, contacted by parents. Um, it's just, uh, if, if, if we're, if we're going to start in the middle of August, uh, it's something that's going to be need to be addressed long term. Um, I think the newer buildings, I think most of those have some kind of cooling system in them. Um, the older buildings do not. And, um, um, you know, I, I uh, we, we, something needs to be done. It's been, it's been beyond bad this year, worse than last year. But it's something that if, if we stay on the same calendar, it's foreseeable that we're going to have this issue uh, again. Thank you. Dan, would you mind addressing that? And chair, members of the board, <clears throat> Mr. Chillock's right. The old uh, buildings don't have air conditioning. This year we did hire uh, Vaughns and we did the same exact thing that we did last year. We put up these giant vac cooler attachments. Uh, I've been in that school. In fact, I've been working in the front offices. Uh, two years ago when we had an exceptionally hot summer, and we it was the first year that we started in August, we did have lots of calls. We had all kinds of phone calls. Last year, I can't remember one this year, my office hasn't received one. If there is a heat, you know, a lack of cooling, it's because, you know, the systems that we do have were fabricated. But just so this board knows, um, I went out to EDA last fall and commissioned EDA, and they're in the process of designing the three units that are in the front part of the old, the old section of the building. They're old, they used to be refrigerated air. Somewhere along the line, someone removed the refrigerated air part. And all we had was mechanical air and they had uh, uh, an evap cool system. Uh, system. Uh, EDA is currently working on, and I'm hoping that they'll get out the papers, because what I'd like to do is go out to bid for all of our projects this year, the end of this year, so we're ready. But we do have a design already in place for three new systems on the old section of the, of the, uh, the high school. The out in the gym areas and the big main air handlers that you see when you're in the uh, on, on the football field, those are giant evaporators, and that's what pulls the bulk the bulk of the high school. The upstairs portion of the high school, if they don't keep certain doors closed, and you know it's just just the way the system is, if they don't keep certain doors open, so other doors closed, um, yeah, you're going to have some stifling you know effect. But it is the best that we can do with what system that we have. Um, but to, we have been active as far as we did go out this year. We did put in, you know, a special cooling system that we designed just for the you know, unit. 
And like I said, EDA was commissioned back in probably in March to come up with a design to replace three main systems that are up in the upper portion. It's the upper portion, as far as I know, that has the heating issue, and that's because it doesn't get the same circulation from the giant air handlers that we have in that school. But once we get those three, I would expect that school to be fairly cool. And like I said, three years ago, when we first started in August, I had all kinds of phone calls. If, uh, for those of you who were on the board back then, remember I was here before the board because there were people who were uh, wanting us to pay for their doctor bills and they were saying taking the kids home sick. I have not heard anything over the last, you know, this last summer and the, and the summer prior to. Mr. Cholock, you mentioned that this was a district-wide concern. What other, what other, what other buildings are you hearing from? Uh, as far as the junior high, we, I was called in there. My guys were trying to figure out the, the systems, and I was upstairs going through the control systems, getting the units going, and I looked over it, and I don't know why. But no one realized, none of my guys knew that there was an adapt cooler system already built into these things. And then it's, it's, it's what they call an indirect adapt cooler system. The high school has it and had it, and the junior high had it. We turned on the water cool systems for the junior high, and we had two of the three going. We got the third one going, and it developed a smell. One of the issues is that we have the pipes that go, <clears throat> just a little bit of real ex quick explanation. Uh, it's like an adapt cooler. The evaporator takes the indoor air and it blows it across these pipes and the pipes are cooled by a mist spray. Those pipes actually go from the return air, the exhaust air, into the supply air at a much cooler temperature. As they bring in outside air, that's the cooling system. Um, they have systems like that today that guarantee you 40 degree temperature drop you know, in, the, in, the, in the camp. One of the systems there has developed a, a leak and it gives a really bad odor in the school, so we had to shut that one down. Uh, as far as the other schools, yeah, they don't have any air conditioning. Uh, and here's the, here's the thing. Up until uh, this year, well, including this year, there is no way that the uh, SFD, the state, will pay for air conditioning. Okay? So that we understand, if you don't have it, they do not pay for it. Now, there is new legislation that is being written that uh, will allow us to use another 10% of our annual funding to put in what they call education suitability. Whatever that means, they have yet to determine. Okay, and I don't have an issue with that, but here's the deal. They allow me to use 10% to do enhancements, they allow me to do 10% to do security, and then another 10% to do security, then, now 10% to do education suitability. That's 40% of what I get. They haven't increased my money, but they're saying now I can use 40% of it. Now, state statute says I cannot address anything. I just read the statute again today because this is a topic of discussion tomorrow at the JAC up in Casper. You cannot, you, you cannot use that money until you have addressed all of the FEA scores. And they come out every four years. And we have over 20, well, when, when I started here, we had over $42 million deferred maintenance. We're down to $24 million. Okay? I get $3.4 million a year. Next year, they're going to start giving it instead of in one lump sums like they used to. Then they broke it down into 80% and 20%. Now it's monthly. So it gets tougher to take on these larger projects when you have monthly lot because the general contractor doesn't care how you get paid, his monthly bill is going to be what it is. So ultimately, Mr. Cholock's right. The older schools they do not have air conditioning. From my perspective, they will not have air conditioning until somebody can figure out a way that we can put air conditioning in. The problem is the systems themselves are old, and they have not been maintained properly. So we have very old HVAC systems in buildings that when we do change them out, it's gonna be, I mean, we're talking, we're not talking a couple hundred thousand dollars. We're talking millions of dollars. 
so we're doing the best we can with what we have. I'm trying to be as crea creative as I can be when we have a system go down in order to get architects to give me at least a design that would like call shelf ready so that if I have major motors go bad, I have dampers go bad that can't be fixed, then that becomes repair and replacement of. But see, it, it, it just, it's a difficult position to be in. I'm not saying we can't do it, but I certainly can't do it tomorrow. I can't do it next year. I can do a little bit at a time. I'm hoping that this summer or this November, November, December seems to be the hot spot now for bidding. Last year, everything that we went out to bid, that's why I'm on your agenda for your one your percent agenda, we had to act as a general contractor because no one was interested in doing work. And it's mainly because I guess everybody's busy. So this year we're going to try to go out to November. I've got a call in to EDA to find out where they're at. Uh, in fact, I met with uh, Will Wheatley today at Plan 1. We discussed EDA and, you know, why why wasn't that ready? I thought that that would be something simple, but apparently they had other projects. So I'm hoping in November, December, that we can go out to bid for some of these projects and get them on. But if any, anybody's welcome, I can shoot you an email and show you what date I actually commissioned EDA to do the high school. And But as far as the other schools, if it's hot, I'm glad they're telling you because no one's telling me. So I would say if you're hot, call the guy who can make something happen rather than go to Mr. Cholock who makes us aware of it at a board meeting, which is fine. But if I don't know about the problem, how can I fix it? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just because of technical difficulties, there will not be a report for the school lunch program. For the general fund, we had a beginning balance of $7,918,257.11. Uh, we had warrants of approximately $4,578,577.63. There was some incoming funds, some voided checks, but we finished with the ending cash balance of $8,751,116.51. Okay, For the Head Start, we had a beginning balance of $55,155.44. We received deposits of $67,647.92. We cleared warrants of $69,252.01 ending balance of $53,551.35. And that concludes my report. So moved. Aye. Aye. Madam Chair, the warrants totaled check number 130827 through 131347. Their total amount was $3,224,665.92. Um, and I have no conflicts to declare. Second. I have a conflict. It is check number 131010. I too have a conflict, check number 00131044. Any further discussion? All in favor of approving the warrants, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Item number eight, the consent agenda. All matters listed under the consent agenda are matters about which the superintendent has governing policies implementation of which is delegated to the superintendent. They will be enacted in one motion in the order listed below. There will be no discussion of these items prior to the time of the Board of Trustees votes on the motion unless members of the board request specific items to be held and discussed separately and or removed from this section. Minutes, 8A, approval of the minutes from the August 12, 2019 workshop. 8B, 
approval of the minutes from the August 12th, 2019 regular board meeting. Finance, 8C, approval of the official bond and oath for the school superintendent. Personnel, 8, 8D, okay, hold, approval of personnel recommendations. Technology, 8E, approval to renew power school. General Board Business, 8F, approval to authorize the Title VIII Impact Aid Survey date of October 9, 2019. Transportation, 8G, approval of the application for reimbursement for private transportation of isolated pupils. Facilities, 8H, post approval of the quote for access control for the security vestibule and system slash structural modification for classrooms project at Rock Springs High School. 8I, post approval of the service agreement for the annual inspections of the fire alarms, sprinklers, and backflow preventers and annual monitoring. 8J, post approval of the quote for carpet tile for the security vestibule and system slash structural modification for classrooms pr project at Rock Springs High School. 8K, post approval of the invoice for the emergency repair of the irrigation system at Eastside Elementary School. 8L, post approval for the district facilities department to act as general contractor for the Rock Springs High School security vestibule and system slash structural modification for classrooms project. 8M, post approval of the invoice for the prefabricated home teardown and set up from Wamsutter to Farson. Okay, is there a motion on all of the items except item 8D? Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The motion passes. Let's go back to 8D, approval of personnel recommendations. Is there a motion? It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Mr. Mickelson. If, if I may, if Mrs. Bolton would please provide us some background and information about the use of long-term subs uh, for the edification of the public. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that is a good inquiry. The long-term subs that we have put in place either have a teaching degree are a retired teacher. Some of them are just right at that end piece to getting their teaching degree or their substitutes that have been in the district for some time have a degree maybe in a different area, but have subbed a lot in a certain subject area, have taught with that team, they interviewed and they felt like they would be the best candidate um, at that time. These decisions were not taken lightly. Of course, if we could, we would have put a qualified, a highly qualified um, teacher into those positions. Um, we are not the only place in the state. I know you guys get around and talk to people around the state and when we go to committees and they're struggling. I mean, we have HR feeds going on that there are, they're not able to fill positions. And what is unique about this year versus previous years, we started to see the issue um, more in special education over the last couple of years across the state. Um, not being able to find school psychologists or speech pathologists, I mean, that is not unique to Rock Springs. That is across the um, entire state. But this year what's been unique is the fact that districts that usually don't even have a problem hiring have open general ed positions. So that's scary. Um, but we are all tackling it as best as we can. Um, I just want to reassure the public, though, that we the schools interviewed um, the substitutes that applied for those positions, and those decisions were not taken lightly um, because we wanted to put the best candidate and individual into that position. Some of them are only going to be temporary. Um, we do have some prospects for some of the positions being filled in January. So. Does that help? Is there anything other specific that? No, thank you, Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, I know multiple other districts that are doing this, and I think it is important for folks to be aware 
say it, this is not the time for the legislature to cut funding to districts. Oh my gosh. Uh, if we hope to have teachers at all, and it is my understanding that education is, is going to be a primary focus of theirs in this session in terms of how did they got their funding. Uh, and so that issue will get way worse before it gets any better if that happens. Yeah, I'm terrified about that discussion. I've heard that coming down the pike. And I mean, we were able to give the teachers a raise to the base and across the board. And I was so excited about that until the next evening I got on the news and Utah matched it. And flat out, the, the, the reality of it is, is if you talk to, I've talked to numerous human resource directors, even down in Utah and, and across the state, they're flocking to, I don't even want to say this out loud, they're flocking to a different type of school calendar setup, or they are, um, they're flocking to places that have Target and the different amenities that we don't offer. So, and that's just the reality of the situation and what we're dealing with right now. And so problem solving through that, definitely. Um, one thing I want to try to avoid is um, hiring blindly because that has bit us before. Um, when you offer contracts too early and then you're stuck. Um, they, I've talked to Utah, I've talked around the state, and some of those are really backfiring too. So. I don't know if there's solutions out there and working together, but it is definitely not a Sweetwater One issue in and of itself. It's across the state of Wyoming, and I hope that um, the state really looks into the shortage and the te this It's hit us finally, and I don't know how else to put it, and it's not fun. You know, I've never envied the other states that have been in this situation, and now we're in it, and I really don't envy them. So, yeah. But we are putting the best we can. You know, they have supports within the schools as well, so thank you. Nicole, I, I noticed you say the University of Wyoming and Utah. Is there anything that precludes us from going to other states like Montana or Colorado? Or I, I don't, I'm saying that only because if there is a policy that says we can't, I, I think we better change it. Right. So we've gone to South Dakota, we've gone to Colorado, we do go to Montana, we've gone to Idaho. Um, I typically try to go to other states as well that um, maybe our salary has a significant gap so it's a little more intriguing um, to get them here. Um, so I'm sorry, I mentioned those two because those are the latest ones I've been talking to the HR um, directors, but I mean over the last couple of years and just we're going to try to hit the job fairs really heavy in um, Idaho and this year, unlike other years, I have a well, unfortunately, a plethora of jobs that I'm going to have open in January and February when these fairs start hitting, because prior to that, we weren't really sure. And we may just open positions that we're not ready to hire for just to start an applicant pool. So if someone resigns, we have an applicant pool to, to jump on. Um, so we are looking at some various ways to try to attack the problem. But no, we are going to go all around the states. So, yeah. Further discussion? Mr. Reedy? Mr. Bolton, I have a question. I know there's been some, some talk uh, here and there about, well, there's certain people that never got their contract renewed um, that were fairly new to the district. And uh, I'm assuming that there's a very plausible reason for that, um, more likely that they weren't the best fitting individual for the position. But uh, would I be correct in assuming that? Possibly I, every situation is unique. I have to be so careful in how I answer that. That just comes down to the personnel aspect. And you don't just, yeah, to answer that in a more broad term, though, we don't just non-renew someone to non-renew them. There is always going to be a reason. Unfortunately, that reason is not going to get out. Um, whatever people want to say, that's the story they're going to hear. And that's, if they choose to believe that, I just am not privileged to ever, nor are you guys, to ever speak about um, that piece and so you're right there's some teachers we may not put back in the classroom um, because ultimately we need to do what's best for kids and sometimes that's not always going to be the best choice fortunately that's not the common practice so. that's a good question Thank any you. other questions I will mention that uh, joint revenue 
uh, Legislative Interim Committee is meeting in Pinedale on uh, September 18th and 19th. I do plan to attend that meeting just to see what their thoughts are because the, the problem is we're not generating anything and to see what recommendations come forward. The joint education meets in Cody, nice, nice drive in the fall. Uh, I believe it's September 25th and 26th, which I am also an, an anticipating attending. And that should give us an idea about what they're actually going to bring forward. Uh, mm -hmm. so they have instructed LSO to draft some legislation, so it depends on what is passed forward. And that may give us some ideas about where they're headed. So that may, that may help. Well, I appreciate that we have the support we have and the representation around the state. And depending where it goes, we'll up the representation. Um, there's been numerous times we've made an overnight trip or a day trip down there to, to speak our piece. I don't know that they always want to hear it, but we're going to say it. So, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a motion and a second to approve uh, 8D. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Pa uh, uh, opposed, nay. Okay, the motion passes. Okay, the addendum. Uh, item number one on the addendum is transportation. Recommendation for approval to declare the following vehicles as surplus property and to be disposed of by the most efficient method in the best interest of the mile of the district. Uh, I'm not going to read the miles. If people are interested in the miles that are on these vehicles, then I'll be happy to share that. Unit one, number 143, a 1999 Type A bus. Unit number 142, a one, 1999 Type A bus. Unit 116, 1999 Type, type A bus. Unit number 127, a 1977 facilities dump truck. Unit 120, a 1989 facilities pickup. Unit 190, 121, excuse me, 1995 facilities pickup. Unit 340, 1992 facilities van. Unit number 251, a 19, 1999 facilities pickup. Unit 129, 1988 facilities pickup. Unit number 174, a 1989 Nutrition Services box van. Unit number 107, 2003 District Fleet Suburban. Unit number 109, a 2003 District Fleet Suburban. Unit number 25, a 2008 Type A bus. Unit number 181, a 2004 Type A bus. And unit number 740, a 2003 Type A bus. Is there a motion? Moved and seconded uh, to approve recommendation to declare these vehicles surplus property. Madam Chair. Uh, discussion. Mr. Jackman. Uh, just a quick one. I was in high school in auto shop. We had a couple old pickups that were declared surplus that we used to take apart and put back together. Is that so when even an option anymore? When they declared surplus or put out, if some of them we don't need to save. But the policy allows them to get the distribution of the and the things that they do. Um, yeah. I don't know if we have any in there at all. I was just curious that's something that we did. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor of the recommendation for approval, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Okay, number two, class size, board action. Recommendation for approval to allow the district to exceed, as needed, the maximum number of students per classroom from 27 students in 7th through 12th grade to 30 students for the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year. Administration will monitor class sizes and a monthly update will be shared with the Board of Education. The intent of the recommendation is to keep class sizes at 27 or less, if at all possible. Is there a motion? It's been moved. And seconded. Discussion. Mrs. Bolton. Um, gosh, I was really hoping I wasn't going to have to do that update <laughs> this year. <laughs> um, but I have to give credit where credit is due because the principals have been working tirelessly trying to balance out classrooms. Um, and, and Annie said it best. When you implement a new system, at some point there's going to be um, 
some pieces maybe that didn't click right away, and you have to work through and manually adjust those. I know that they've been um, moving classes like crazy. One of the things that will not most likely change unless one of the students move, um, we have two classes that have to do with our um, Help Academy, and it had, we usually accept students in increments of 27, and somehow an extra student made it in, which yay for that student, and we're not gonna take that opportunity from them by any means, but that one extra student also isn't enough to open up another section. So right now, the health occupation one, unless someone moves, that will stay at 28, um, and it won't grow because that enrollment time was already done. And then it's a, just for this semester, it's a US history class because of the cohort together, but next semester, Right now, the number's not up there, but all the schedules aren't done. Um, so those are the two main ones. I know I saw the emails flying all the way up into the beginning of the board meeting where Annie and Fred have been working with their counselors to um, combine some classes um, and do different things just so that uh, they could get the class size under. So really, it's just for a couple classes, and hopefully it stays at that. Um, I can give you the specific classes, but I can tell you even right before the meeting and we pulled up power school numbers were changing so I don't even know how accurate that is but um, we have US history um, fifth period with Amber Lee Beardsley it currently has 28 um, seventh period Ameri uh, American literature had that but they moved a, ki a kiddo voluntarily went to a different elective in um, class so that's no longer at 28 and then we have the fourth period health occupations with Rick Mitchelson at 28. So those are really the two classes at the high school. Was it the high school? They're correct? both at the high school. We do have one at the junior high, and um, I don't know if it was an oversight or I, I don't know the whole story to that. I'll let Ms. Kendall get back to me. Maybe you have that, but it's first hour drama on a B day. Mr. Merrill has 28 students in there instead of just 27, but I'm not sure the background to that yet. Did, did you get that? Friday, so somewhere that student in, so. Yeah, we're just seeing, and in all fairness, Miss Kundal and them didn't have a whole lot of time to get back to us today as we were scouring through numbers, and so she'll get back to us at her earliest convenience, but honestly, it's really the two classes at the high school right now, and the one I, is the only one I foresee being an issue, not really an issue, but, you know, through the year at being at 28. Again, I just want to go on record saying we're not doing this to look at increasing any class sizes over 27 um, if we don't have to. And honestly, throughout the schedule, it doesn't look like we should need to. This just, we, no, 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 that's no how that happened. But it happened, and we're not going to take the opportunity from the kiddos, so. Mrs. Jellico. Um, one other comment, too. A question that we get asked a lot is about the policy. So when you ask the board for approval on something with a policy it brings the whole policy back you can't bring just a, a sentence in the policy or a section what have you and so for that reason that's why we end up bringing the whole thing back for that even though we've narrowed down what that recommendation is just for 7th through 12th grade with an update to the board but i think that's important for the public to know i mean the intent is not to do that k-12 but only in those classes we are absolutely in dire strait. There's nothing else we can do. Mr. Mickelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Bolton. So embarrassingly, I've never been a teacher, and so I'm looking for a little help to understand. One of the things that's always kind of bugged me about this particular issue, and same thing when the legislature was like, the magic is if you know kindergartners, there's only 12 kids to one teacher, Cohorts are different, classes are different, the ratio in a CBI classroom, very different from calculus, right? Yeah. <laughs> Does this allow you guys some flexibility to meet the needs of students, not based on an arbitrary ratio, but on what the teachers and students need and can handle? So ironically, no, not really. <laughs> but, but, can I put you guys on the spot? And so this is something that it may, this is just an idea. We're trying to brainstorm some ideas. This is something that would have to go to policy committee, would have to go through Ms. McGovern first. Um, 
but looking at ways that you can be more flexible with that, not take it like, you know, I know I've been a teacher and sometimes some of my smaller classes have been harder than my larger classes. I just could go off of what research says class size, you know, um, state, but in looking at some flexibility models and looking, Annie, can it look red? Can I bring? Mrs. Mrs. Fletcher, would you come to the microphone, please? Thank you. As we went through and we're looking at numbers and, and checking these numbers daily starting probably June 1st, um, we started to look at what are other places doing and, and what are some options that we might have. And one of the things we talked about as an administrative team putting on our teacher hat was the idea that there are classes that are just fine to be 29. And there are classes that if you told me there had to be 29 in there, um, you'd be finding a new teacher. But the other thing is we have a lot of teachers last year and this year who say, I'm okay taking that extra kid because I don't want to take that opportunity away. So we were looking at what would it look like if instead of thinking about it class by class, we thought about it in a little bit more of an elementary model and we thought about teacher load. So if I have six classes, and an average class has 27 kids in it, does it really matter if they're all 27, or can one be 29 and one be 23? I still have the same papers to grade. I still have the same workload. It's just divided up differently. Would something like that allow us a little more flexibility in some of these cases? Uh, we ended up with one in our Fire Law Leadership Academy where because of the needs of the juniors, one section is really small, the other section is much bigger, just because so many kids wanted to take that AP class or that advanced English class that was that other hour, the teacher would have had no problem if I would have went, Ms. Rubich, can I make 129 and 122 instead of splitting them evenly? Um, under the current policy, we would be right here asking you for forgiveness, um, which we're doing. <laughs> Um, but there would be other cases where if we were thinking about it as that teacher load over the course of the day, that there could be some flexibility there. We wouldn't want to make one class 50 and one class 1. We'd want to look at what would be comfortable with those bounds, but providing that flexibility and still supporting our teachers. Uh, we have teachers that have 162 kids in the day. We have our CBI group that if I had more than 12 or 13 in there, we'd have a problem. So knowing that there's some differences from, from situation to situation. We're looking at different options and we'll be presenting those as we go through, but we want that flexibility to be able to meet the needs as we go forward. So, so what, what Fred is talking about is that we went through and we tallied teacher load for every single teacher in our building. When we knew that these numbers were getting close, we wanted to make sure we weren't overloading teachers and that by chance, these classes that had the potential to go over weren't all gonna be loaded on a certain teacher because that would really put an undue burden. Um, our teacher loads fall between 162 and they go down to about 110 kids, depending upon what the people are teaching in, in those different areas. So if you think of 27 times six is kind of your, your top cap. You also have to remember that there are classes that can't hold that much. The kitchen only holds 16. I can only put 15 in the pool safely. So thinking about some of those other spots, you can't, you can't go by an average over the whole building. There's gonna be some differences from space to space. So the simple answer to your question is no, that the maximum number really pigeonholes us in having to beg for forgiveness. And so looking at what does research say the max threshold is, which I think we're pretty close to it in our, um, our four through 12, 
but maybe looking at some other ways that we could look at a holistic view of caseload um, per teacher so that we have a little bit of flexibility so that we're not so pigeonholed and having to be so strict with some of these schedules that we're not able to, well, we'll meet their needs one way or the other. They figure it out. But. So no, but hopefully eventually, <laughs> yeah, that's the hope. Further discussion? I just simply want to remind everyone that we, we went through this the last couple of years. And uh, with the monthly updates, it didn't change. And at semester time, we actually reduced down. Uh, it sounds like maybe the, the academy one we may have all year. Just the one class. The just other the one, one I think right, the, the academy one semester. may be there all year. Yeah. But, uh, you know, our intent clearly is not to, over, not to go beyond the 27 if at all possible, and yet we have to, we just cannot hire another teacher with these small numbers beyond the 27. Right. So I just want to emphasize that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion uh, to approve the uh, district to exceed the 27 students, 7th through 12th, uh, as needed. Um, we have a motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The motion passes. Okay, we're moving on to the good of the order. Anyone? Mr. Mickelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add three things, I guess. First, I have had multiple people uh, cost me to tell me how absolutely outstanding the Hall of Fame induction dinner was and how tickled they were with it and how cool they thought it was to have it at the school and gave everything. And it, it, it uh, has made my 10-year-old very frustrated when we're at the grocery store. And she says, are you ever going to stop talking, Daddy? Which I think everyone here can testify, no, never. <laughs> um, and then uh, I will not be going to the Joint Appropriation Committee because I will be at a state board meeting. And then the third thing, I don't know if you all have seen, you guys know uh, Rose Klein has done several murals around town. We've had her do several at, at our office. And uh, surprise, she finished the third one today. Um, tomorrow night, so at Able Hands at 126 Elk Street, we're having an open house because we had folks from the community who were like, well, when do we get to come see the art? And Tuesday, um, and there'll be, you know, light refreshments, but I would invite all of you uh, to pop by and see them. They're really cool. She did a beautiful job, and we're super excited to uh, have those and share them with the community. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Batolo. Uh, I'd like to second what Max said about the uh, Hall of Fame, but I'd also like to mention the fact that the Tiger Town Bash, I think that was as as well orchestrated. Uh, there was a little bit of a problem with the weather, and some of us didn't really pay attention when it said South Front or North, whatever it said. I was on the wrong side of the street, but for a little bit. But uh, it was awesome. Also, the uh, the Foundation Golf Tournament was fabulous. All that was great. Um, I also have uh, responsibilities to be on the board of the Child Development Center. Um, they are reporting that there are 429 students that they've tested so far, which is a whole lot. Um, we have 167 students from the Rock Springs Center and 163 in Green River. Um, they also had on, as luck would have it, everything happens on the same day, they had a um, 40th anniversary on Saturday. So uh, congratulations to them on that. And then the last one, I'd like to congratulate uh, Farson High School as, as part of my other responsibility. I'm, the, I'm on the Curriculum Council. And um, in that Curriculum Council, we talked about the fact that Farson High School has added an FFA chapter to their school. And I'd just like to congratulate them for that. Anyone? I want, uh, I'm part of the Community Fine Arts Committee, and uh, we are announcing a 80th anniversary of the art collection in conjun conjunction with the Community Fine Arts Center. That will be October 10th, a reception at the Fine Arts Center. 
uh, on C Street from 5 until 7. We are looking at ways to participate uh, with the Fine Arts Center regarding that. Um, I, too, want to offer my congratulations. I attended the uh, golf tournament Saturday and, again, the banquet that night. Very well done. Uh, kudos to all those who were on the committees. A wonderful, wonderful job. I think everybody, all the comments I heard were very, very positive. So thank you very much. Any further comments? Okay, item number 10, new business. 10A, you have the vacancy notice as of September 3rd, 2019. Thank you for the update on that, Mrs. Bolton. Uh, 10B, calendar for the months of September, October, November, and December, which will take us up to the 2020. Uh, items 10C, August 2019, Head Start Liaison Report. Um, and so item number 11, uh, we have an executive session for discussion of legal and personnel matters. We do not anticipate any board action when we come out. So is there a motion to adjourn to executive session? Seconded. Moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 So we are adjourned to an executive session. Again, we do not anticipate any action upon our return.